I am not your perfect Mexican daughter. Chapter 6 My cousin Victor is turning 7 today, and my tío Bigotes, yes, Uncle Mustache, is throwing him a big birthday party to celebrate, but I think it's just an excuse for him to get drunk. As Amai is brushing her hair in the bathroom, I tell her she looks pretty and ask if I can stay home. I want to figure out how to get back into Olga's room. The key must be in the apartment somewhere. But Ama says no without even bothering to look at me. Maybe she thinks that if she leaves me alone, I'm going to orchestrate a giant orgy or overdose on heroin. I don't know why she doesn't trust me. I keep telling her that I will never get pregnant like my cousin Vanessa. But it doesn't matter to her. Even if I don't find the key, at least I'd be alone. I'm hardly ever by myself in the apartment because Ama is always all up in my business and won't leave me behind. Sometimes, when my parents go to bed, I open all the windows, which Ama hates, and let the breeze flap the curtains open. I sit in the living room with a cup of coffee, journal, book, and reading lamp. I like the late night sounds of traffic, even if they're disrupted by pops of gunshots. I decide to keep begging, Amma, please, I just want to stay here and read. I hate parties. I'm just going to sit somewhere by myself. I don't want to talk to anyone. What kind of girl hates parties? This kind, I say, pointing to myself. You know that. Theo's house always smells of old fruit and wet dog, which I don't understand because Chompiras has been dead for three years. The stereo is blasting Los Bukis and screaming children are running in and out of the house. Though I really hate kids, the part I hate most about these parties is arriving and departing. If I don't kiss each and every relative on the cheek hello and goodbye, even if I don't know them, Ama calls me a malcriada, a badly raised daughter. You want to be like those güeros, mal educados? Ama always asks me. In that case, yes, I do want to be like an impolite white person, but I just shut my mouth because it's not worth arguing about. I kiss everyone in the house hello, including Tio Cayetano, even though I can't stand him. When I was a kid, he used to stick his finger in my mouth when no one was looking. The last time he did it was during Vanessa's communion party when I was 12. I was in the bathroom while everyone was in the backyard. As I came out, he forced his finger in my mouth much deeper than the times before, so I bit him. I clamped my mouth and wouldn't let go. I think I wanted to reach bone. Hija de tu pinche madre, he yelled. When I finally released his finger, he walked back outside, shaking his hand, letting the blood drip onto the floor. He told everyone the dog had bitten him and left the party with the paper towel wrapped around his finger. I sat in a corner for the rest of the night, drinking cup after cup of pop to get the salty, metallic taste of his blood out of my mouth. I wonder if he ever did anything like that to Olga. Tio Bigote's wife, Paloma, rushes to get us some food once we finish greeting every single person at the party. Tia Paloma is a woman so big that her stomach hangs low and everything wiggles when she walks. Every time I see her, I wonder how she and Theo have sex. Or maybe they don't even do it now that Theo has that new mistress we've heard rumors about. Ama says Paloma has a thyroid problem, and I feel bad for her. But I've seen her eat three tortas in one sitting. Thyroid my ass. After I finish eating, I'm so full, my pants nearly cut off my circulation. I'm uncomfortable no matter how I sit or shift. I almost want to lie down and let the food spread out. I don't know why I do this. Sometimes it's like I'm eating to drown something yowling inside me, even when I'm not really hungry. I pray that I never get as big as Tia Paloma. Buena para comer, Tia Milagro says, eyeballing my clean plate. Normally, I wouldn't be offended by a compliment like this. Mexicans are always saying that about kids. It's meant as a compliment. Good eaters are people who will eat anything put in front of them with no complaints. They eat with enthusiasm. It means they aren't picky or entitled brats. But this time, I know it isn't meant as praise because Tia Milagros is always talking shit. I used to like her when I was younger, 
but she's become a bitter, resentful woman over the years. Her husband left her for a woman half her age a long time ago, and she's been salty ever since. It's hard to take her seriously with her red perm and 80s bangs, but it pisses me off that I've become the target of her passive-aggressive cracks. Something about me just makes her angry. She is always sucking her teeth at what I'm wearing or making some comment about my weight, even though she's more floppy and misshapen than a sack of laundry. She loved Olga, though. Everyone did. I watched my cousin Vanessa feeding her daughter mashed up beans. Only 16 and she already has a baby. That would be the worst thing that's ever happened to me. But Vanessa seems happy somehow. She's always giving Olivia kisses and telling her how much she loves her. I wonder if she'll ever finish high school. What kind of life can you have when you live with your parents and have a baby to take care of? Olivia is cute and all, but I never know what to do with babies. I walk outside and see my cousins Freddy and his wife Alicia arrive as the piñata is being set up. I've always been fascinated by them. Freddy graduated from the University of Illinois and works as an engineer downtown and Alicia was a theater major at DePaul and works at Steppenwolf. They are always dressed like they stepped off a runway. Alicia has the most interesting outfits. Dresses made of bright, crazy fabrics and earrings that look like they belong in museums. Today, two silver hands dangle from her ears. Freddy wears dark jeans and a black blazer. There's no one in my family like them. No one has ever gone to a real college. I always want to ask them a million questions. Hey guys, how are you? What's new? I feel like a frumpy dork when I talk to them because they seem so sophisticated. I get shy. We're good, Freddy says solemnly. I'm so sorry about your sister. We were in Thailand and couldn't make it to the funeral. Everyone in the house begins to come outside for the piñata. Victor suddenly starts crying because it isn't ready yet. Jesus, what a baby. Yeah, we're so sorry, Alicia says, taking my hand. That's what everyone says about Olga. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I never know what to say. Is thank you the right answer? Thailand, how cool. What's that like? I don't want to talk about my sister. It was beautiful, Freddy smiles. I see Tia Paloma wiping Victor's face with the end of her blouse. He's hysterical. Yeah, we got to ride elephants, Alicia adds. It was amazing. So what are you thinking for college? Freddy looks uncomfortable. He can probably sense that they shouldn't talk about Olga anymore. I think I might visibly recoil every time someone says her name. I don't really know. I want to move away to New York, I think, somewhere with a good English program. But my grades haven't been great lately, I'm, so I'm kind of worried. I really have to get my GPA up or else I'm screwed. When I remember the C I got on my last algebra test, it feels like snakes hatching and slithering in my stomach. Well, listen, if you ever need help with your applications or have any questions, please let us know. We need more people like you in college, Freddie says. Totally, Alicia nods, her silver hands swinging. I can probably get you a summer job at my company when you're old enough. It would look great on a college application. Thanks, I say. I don't know what Freddie means by people like me. What am I like? Why would anyone care if I go to college or not? There's no one else I feel like talking to, so I go to the living room to read The Catcher in the Rye, which I had to smuggle in my bag because Amma always complains when I read at parties. Why do I have to be so disrespectful, she wants to know. Why can't I just be at peace with my family? But I don't feel like talking most of the time, and today everyone is going to be asking about my quinceañera. Besides, all of my little cousins are still trying to break the piñata, and I doubt anyone will notice that I'm gone. I just hope Tio Cayetano doesn't come in here when I'm alone. I get to read for a solid half hour before I'm interrupted. When I get to the part where Holden drops and shatters his little sister's record, my dad and uncles pile into the dining room to bust out the expensive tequila from the liquor cabinet. I should have known. This happens at every party. Today, the bottle Tio Bigotes takes out is 
bright green and shaped like a gun. Like always, they sit around the dining room table, passing the tequila and talking about how great it was to live in their hometown of Los Ojos. How I miss my little town, Chingao. Tio Octavio closes his eyes and shakes his head, as if reminiscing about a lost love. Remember how we used to skip school and go swimming in the river? Tio Cayetano asks as he pours himself another shot. I wish I would never have left, Apa says quietly. If they love that town so much, why don't they just go back and live there? I wonder. Always crying about Mexico, as if it were the best place on earth. I go back to my book, but Tio Bigotes motions for me to come near him. Come here, mija. I walk to the table and stand a few feet away, but he tells me to get closer. He pulls me toward him and puts his arm around my neck. His breath smells like tequila, cigarettes, and something deeper and more disgusting. I can't figure out. I try to pull back subtly, but it's no use. His arm is locked around me. I wish Apa would save me, but he just looks down into his drink. What were you doing here in the living room by yourself? I was trying to finish my book, I explain. What do you want books for at a party, he slurs. Family is what's most important in life, mija. Go outside and talk to your cousins. But I like to read. For what? I want to be a writer. I want to write books. Tio Bigotes takes another gulp of his drink. Are you excited about your party? I guess. What do you mean you guess? You should be excited. Your parents are making a big sacrifice for you. Right, a sacrifice I don't want. You know, without family, you won't make it in this life. And now that you're older, you have to learn how to be a nice senorita just like your sister. May she rest in peace. Tio nods his head dramatically, then looks me straight in the eye to see if I've understood his point. But I want to finish my book, Tio. I stumble over my Spanish and feel my face get hot. Tio Bigotes takes another shot of tequila and lets go of my neck as Ama comes into the living room. She purses her lips like she's just bitten into an onion and calls them all a bunch of sorry drunks. Look at this one. Tio Bigotes ignores her and gestures toward me with the glass. With a cactus on her forehead and she can barely speak Spanish. This country is ruining your children, sister. He points at Ama as he gets up from the table. No one seems to know what to say. Apa is still looking into his drink as if searching for some sort of answer. Ama crosses her arms and glares at Tio Bigotes as he walks out of the room. Tio Cayetano pours himself another. This is number four. I've been counting. Everyone is silent until we hear the violent puking coming all the way from the bathroom. I touch my forehead and imagine a spindly cactus pressed there. My face bloody like Jesus. That night I dream I'm sleeping in Ama's old room at Mama Jacinta's house when it catches fire. I run out into the street barefoot in a bright blue nightgown before it all burns down. I stand there watching the house as it crackles and sputters. The cool mud under my feet. Suddenly Papa Feliciano, Ama's dead father, is standing behind me holding a dead goat in his hands. Its head hanging from its neck by a long thin nerve. There is blood splattered all over his face and clothes. Everything is off in the way dreams are. The house is much bigger than I remember, and there are giant oak trees everywhere. Some things are even in reverse or upside down, like an empty car driving backward. I know I'm in Los Ojos, but it is so different, so deserted. The house across the street has been replaced by a field of sunflowers. Where is Mama Jacinta? I scream at my grandfather, but he doesn't answer. He offers me the limp goat in his arms. I scream and scream while he stands there blinking at me. I don't know if Mama Jacinta is dead or alive. The fire begins to grow, so I run toward the river. I feel the heat on my back, singeing the ends of my hair. Rocks cut my feet. It's night, but the sky is still bright somehow. The sound of crickets is almost deafening. It smells like wet earth. I jump into the water when the fire finally reaches me, near the abandoned train station. When I open my eyes, the water is thick and dirty, and a group of mermaids tangled in garbage and seaweed swim toward me, their long hair floating all around their faces. Their tails are iridescent green, and their breasts are small and bare. The one in the middle turns toward me and waves. It's Olga. 
She has the same smile she had on her face when she died, and her skin is glowing as if something were lit inside her. Olga! I yell, my lungs filling with cloudy water. Olga, please come back! The other mermaids gently take her away. I try swimming toward them, but my lungs won't work. It's as if they were chained to the bottom of the river. I wake up crying, gasping for air. Chapter 7 Lorena has a new friend at school who's gay as a rainbow-colored unicorn. She met him in the lunch line when he complimented her ridiculous green heels. They started talking about clothes, makeup, and unfortunate fashion choices of the rich and famous, and that was that. Best friends forever. He told her about the wild and crazy parties he frequents with his entourage of drag queens, which got Lorena worked up. All she ever wants to do is party. Now they talk all the time and even hold hands when they walk down the halls. When Lorena tells me his name, I refuse to believe it because it's so utterly stupid. His name is Juan Garcia, but he goes by Juanga, which is the name of Juan Gabriel, Mexico's most beloved singer who is flaming, but has never officially come out of the closet. How can he compare himself to him? I mean, it's like calling yourself Jesus Christ or Joan of Arc. So, of course, I hate him immediately. I can't deny that I'm jealous. Lorena and I have been Siamese twins since the day we met. Juanga better watch himself. Our history teacher is sick today, which means it'll be a free period. Our sub, Mr. Blankenship, breathes loudly through his mouth and wears a pilling green sweater two sizes too small. I can see his hairy belly when he lifts his arms. I don't know where the hell they find these people. The last substitute had a lisp and wore a fanny pack. Instead of continuing to work on our research projects, he pops in a documentary about World War II, which we've already covered. Not even 10 minutes into the movie and he's fast asleep, snoring wetly. The whole class slowly sprouts into chaos. Some people play music on their phones. Jorge and David throw a miniature football back and forth across the room. And Dario climbs on his desk and starts dancing, flipping his hair and pouting his lips. He does this every single time a teacher leaves the room. Something about the way he moves reminds me of a flamingo. We have to go to a masquerade Juanga invited me to. Lorena turns to me, her eyes wide. Everyone, and I mean everyone is going to be there it's at this fancy loft in the west loop just hearing his name chafes me who is this everyone you refer to you know i hardly even like people plus my mom would have a heart attack no way part of me is intrigued by the party but the other part of me doesn't want to spend a night hanging out with wanga he hasn't reached arch nemesis status but i certainly don't want to be friends Oh my God, just lie to her, stupid. You never learn, do you? Tell her we're going on an overnight field trip to visit a college. That doesn't make any damn sense. We're juniors, remember? How would she believe that? A bomb suddenly explodes in the video, and Mr. Blankenship wakes up for about half a second. Here, take this to your crazy-ass mom, Lorena says, handing me a sheet of paper. I already thought ahead. We have to go to this party. According to the form, we're visiting the University of Michigan to see what college life is like. We'll be staying in the dorms, eating meals at the school cafeteria, watching a play, and taking a tour. Lorena translated it into Spanish on the back. She was even able to get it on the school letterhead somehow. I'm in awe. Where did you get this? Don't worry about it, Lorena says, smiling. Seriously, this is really impressive. I had no idea you were this smart. Bitch. Well, okay, I stole the letterhead from Mr. Zuniga's desk and made up the rest. I guess you only play dumb, huh? I try patting her on the head, but she ducks and swipes at my hand. If you miss this party, you're going to be sorry. When I give Amma the permission form after school, she says no without even looking at me. That's what she always does. It's like I don't even deserve the dignity of eye contact. But I'm not surprised. Of course I'm not. I was prepared for this. I even wrote notes beforehand to help guide my argument. I beg and plead and tell her how much I want to go to college, how this will be a great opportunity, how I need this for my emotional and intellectual development. 
After about 10 minutes of groveling, though, it's clear she's not having any of it. No daughter of mine is going to be sleeping in the streets. The streets? That doesn't make any sense. I'm going to be in a dorm. You think you're all grown up? You're only 15. You don't even know how to make a tortilla. I'm beginning to froth with fury. Ama is so dramatic. Sometimes I want to run out of our apartment screaming and never come back. I don't know what tortillas have to do with anything. This is ridiculous. I want to go to college. I want to see the world. I never get out of this stupid neighborhood. My bottom lip quivers. I'm almost starting to believe my own lie. You can live here and go to college, you know? That's what Olga did. Absolutely not. Never. I'd rather live in a barrel than stay here and go to community college. Olga went there for four years and never even graduated. I'm not entirely sure what she was studying. Business something. How come Olga never felt the need to be out in the streets like some sort of gypsy? She was always so comfortable here at home, spending time with her family. Bien a gusto, mi niña. Amal looks up at the ceiling as if she's trying to talk to my sister in heaven. She was not a girl. She was a grown woman. I don't know why that pisses me off so much. I run to my room and slam the door. I hate when Amma sees me cry. The night of the masquerade, I try to read in the living room, but I can't concentrate because I'm so jittery. I'm just waiting until my parents go to bed so I can slink out of the apartment. On Fridays, they usually go to sleep at about 9, which is so depressing. I'd hate to be old and lame and never do anything fun on weekends. That's why I won't ever get married or have kids. What a pain in the ass. Half an hour after they've gone to sleep, I tiptoe to their door and listen. I hope to God I never ever hear them having sex because if I do, I might have to put poison inside my ears. Maybe they don't have sex anymore though. Who knows? Thankfully, I can hear them both snoring. I don't understand how Ama sleeps through Apa's terrifying growls. I creep back to my room and stuff my bed with pillows and an extra blanket. I take one of my old dolls and put it where my head would be. I cover most of it but leave some strands of her dark hair out to make it look more realistic. I'm pleased with myself for being so clever. If Ama opens the door and doesn't turn on the light, it will definitely work. I've caught Ama peering in here some nights. She is so paranoid. If, for some reason, she decides to lift up the blanket, I've left a note saying I'm with Lorena because she's having a crisis and that I'll be back soon. Don't worry. I doubt it would help much, but it seems better than nothing. Once I put on my only decent black dress, I text Lorena to come get me, and she says she and Juanga will be here in five minutes. I walk to toward the door as quietly as possible. I'm afraid to even blink. It takes me an eternity to turn the doorknob because I don't want to make any noise. When I shut it, I pray that I haven't woken my parents. Now I have to wait on the steps in the cold until they arrive. The sidewalk in front of our building has been crumbling for years and no one has ever bothered to fix it. The few trees on the street are scrawny and have already lost most of their leaves. I hope no one passes by right now. I'm so tired of being harassed by pervs around here. They'd probably bother anything with the semblance of boobs, human or not. I keep checking the time, silently cursing Lorena for lying to me about how long it'd take. What if Ama wakes up and sees me outside? What if someone notices me and rats me out? Our next door neighbor, Doña Josefa, is always peering out the window and is the biggest chismosa I've ever met. I kept thinking and thinking of all the worst case scenarios until I feel like a tornado of worry and consider going back to bed. This party better be the best thing that's ever happened to me. Finally, I see them pull up. It turns out that Juanga doesn't have a license, but he's borrowed his dad's car anyway. Don't worry, bitch. I'm not going to kill you, he says, cackling like a maniac when he sees my worried face. We park in front of a gigantic warehouse just west of downtown. The street is dark and the building looks ancient and abandoned. I'm convinced we'll be raped and or murdered, but I don't say anything because I don't want to be a buzzkill. The only thing that comforts me is that there are a ton of cars parked outside, nice ones too. Before we enter, Juanga hands us both masks. 
Mine is covered with peacock feathers and rhinestones, which is not really my style, but I'll go with it. I'm totally wrong about the apartment. It doesn't look like a crime scene. In fact, it's unlike anything I've ever seen before. I wonder what these people do for a living because this place belongs in a magazine. Chinese lanterns, what appears to be real artwork, and intricately designed rugs. God, I would love to live in a place like this, all by myself. I can't wait to get out of our dilapidated apartment one day. Everyone turns to look at us. We're definitely the youngest people here. They can probably tell even though we're wearing masks. After a few minutes of awkward lingering, a large woman in a tight leather dress and red mask comes running towards us. Hey, bitch, she says to Huanga and gives him a kiss on the cheek. Hey, Huanga squeals and turns to us. This is Maribel, our beautiful host this evening. Such a pleasure, Maribel says, giving a dramatic bow. Her dress is cut so low that I'm afraid one of her boobs will pop out. Make yourselves at home. Don't be shy. There are drinks in the dining room. The three of us make our way to the liquor. Lorena and Juanga pour some shots of I don't know what. I refuse because the last time I drank shots of vodka with Lorena, I threw up so hard it came out of my nose. I open a beer instead, which I regret immediately. This must be what pee and bile taste like. The only other time I tasted beer was when I was 12 and secretly took a sip of Apa's old style when he was in the bathroom. It was disgusting then, and it's disgusting now. I drink it down fast without breathing through my nose. The mask is uncomfortable on top of my glasses, and it's making me sweat and itch. I would have worn my contacts, but I ran out. I'm afraid it's going to give me a pimple, so I take it off. I zone out watching the skyline when a man in a phantom of the opera mask pulls me out to the dance floor. I have no idea who he is, but I don't have to worry because everyone here is queer or trans. It's nice to not have to deal with creepy ass dudes for once. The DJ is playing James Brown and everyone is going wild, flailing their arms and screaming the lyrics. I'm not a good dancer, but I like the beat. Besides, I can't look any worse than the man next to me dancing like a Tyrannosaurus Rex. After a few songs, I begin to loosen up. When I shake my shoulders like the drag queens, they laugh and clap. I'm fascinated by the women here. Even if they're fat, they move as if they think they're fabulous. I wish I could be like that. As I spin around with a lady in a cat suit, someone taps me on the shoulder. A small woman wearing a silver mask tilts her head as if she's trying to figure out who sh how she knows me. Yes? Wait, are you Olga's little sister, Julia? She yells over the music. What? Who are you? I shout back, giving her major side eye. I have no clue who she is. You don't remember me. She takes off her mask. Obviously not. I'm Jasmine, remember? Olga's friend from high school? Look at you all grown up. Then it comes to me, Jasmine, with the overbite and droopy eyes. I remember her name was spelt stupid too. Even as a kid, I thought she was insufferable. Kind of, I say, uninterested. I don't feel like talking to her. I don't want to explain. Aren't you a little young to be at a party like this? How old are you again? There are nosy people everywhere. I turn, apparently. I pretend not to hear. Oh man, I spent so much time at your house. Olga! Angie and I were inseparable sophomore year. I remember you were such a sensitive little girl, always crying about something. I roll my eyes. Why does everyone remind me how much I sucked as a kid? You know, I haven't seen Olga in years. I ran into her when I was shopping a few years ago. She kept going on and on about this guy she was in love with. She was all excited. I had never seen her so happy. The music gets louder, and I can feel the bass thumping throughout my body. Wait, what? Do you mean Pedro the Aardvark? Or was it someone else? What? Jasmine cups her hand to her ear. The dude that looked like an Aardvark, Pedro? I use my hand to illustrate a snout since she can't understand, but she is still confused. Jasmine moves in closer. I can feel her hot breath on my face. So how is Olga? We didn't keep in touch after I moved to Texas. I come back every once in a while. This is my cousin's party. She points to Maribel who blows us kisses. She's dead. I refuse to say passed away like everyone else. 
Why can't people say what they mean? What? Jasmine looks confused. I said, she's dead. I feel the beer slosh around in my stomach. The room is twirling now. I can't believe this. We, we were friends. Jasmine looks like she might cry. Maybe I shouldn't have told her. How did it happen? She was so young. Oh my God. She got ran over by a semi. It happened in September. I can't go anywhere without talking about my dead sister. And every time I do, I think I might pass out or throw up. Jasmine's eyes well up with tears. I leave her standing there and run to the bathroom. When I bend over the toilet, nothing comes out. I splash cold water on my face, which smudges my eyeliner and mascara. I try wiping my makeup with a piece of toilet paper, but I still look like the Joker. I'll just have to put my mask back on. I take a few deep breaths before I go back outside. I'm having a hard time breathing at a normal pace, like my body suddenly forgot. Maybe Jasmine wasn't talking about Pedro. I rush out and look for her all throughout the loft. I even look outside, but she must have left. I don't see her anywhere. I find Juanga and Lorena doing shots in the kitchen. Here, take this. You need it. Lorena hands me a glass. The smell of it makes my stomach flip, but I drink it anyway. It burns my throat and sends a pleasant warmth all throughout my body. My muscles begin to soften. No wonder so many people are alcoholics. I'm drunk by the time Juanga and Lorena are ready to go home. I don't know exactly how many drinks Juanga had, but I'm 100% sure he shouldn't be driving. What choice do I have though? How else would I get home? I can barely keep my eyes open, but I can feel Juanga swerve all over the expressway. When we get off the exit ramp, he slams on the brakes so hard, I nearly hit my head on the back of Lorena's seat. Sorry, 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 he slurs. I hope to God that Juanga doesn't kill me, because then Emma would truly go crazy. It's nearly time to wake up and start the day again. The sky is still dark, but it's beginning to brighten. There are beautiful, faint streaks of orange over the lake. It looks like it's been cracked open. I think of Jasmine's face when I told her about Olga. Everywhere I go, my sister's ghost is hovering. Thank you for enjoying chapters six through seven. Please answer the questions on the Google Doc on Schoology. Until next time, in la quetch.